Where is time? Where does it come from? And what is destiny? If time is the self-negation of space, and space and time are bound together in the motion of every place, then the automation of motion in mechanics constitutes an acceleration of time. Time is an essential moment of knowledge of God, for the Son of God is, in the Gospels, both the external creator of the world of time, who is also shown to have become flesh, to paradoxically enter into time, and on the cross to recreate and restore the world. The divine Logos communicates from God to the world with the invention of technological artifacts. With the invention of simple machines, the natural movements of terrestrial mechanics can be formally redirected across the space of geometrical proportions to accelerate in time. With the invention of the digital computer, this accelerating momentum of analog motion can be reciprocally calculated to program its own mechanical motion and virtually produce any conceivable machine. And with the development of the internet, this accelerating grammar has been radically transformed by this continuous acceleration. Accelerationism names this continuous increase in the motion of cybernetic systems that anticipates an apocalyptic scissora for the politics of the past. It advocates for the successive obsolescence of all previous forms of politics, whether gradualist or horizontalist, in favor of apocalyptic ruptures. And it fissures across the scissora as left accelerationism retains while right accelerationism abolishes human politics. The term accelerationism was first introduced in 2010 by Benjamin Noyes to describe the post-Marxist radicalization of the accelerating dynamics of capital re-territorialization, especially as it was described in the writings of Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari. The core tenets of accelerationism are often attributed to the English philosopher and cybernetic theorist Nick Land, who among the founding members of the University of Warwick Cybernetic Culture Unit drew inspiration from the writings of Georges Bataille and Friedrich Nietzsche. The movement of accelerationism has since come to be fissured between right and left accelerationism. Right accelerationism has, following Nick Land, advocated for the acceleration of cybernetic capitalism as an engine of escape from leftist, democratic, and socialist politics. Left accelerationism has, on the contrary, advocated for acceleration as an escape from neoliberalism and the alt-right. Accelerationism can thus be regarded as a cybernetic escape from all hitherto existing programs of human politics. Central to accelerationism is the question of how the progress of techno-industrial science can be cancelled, slowed, and reversed, such that democratic politics can endure in spite of the increasing accumulation of capital, commodities, and data. In short, right accelerationists argue for the abolition of, while left accelerationists argue for the preservation of democratic politics, in spite of the adverse conditions of technological change. Alternatively, a Christian and royalist third-way alternative between right and left accelerationism could recollect an origin and a leap that exceeds the imminent dynamics of time. Most expressly in the Liturgy of the Eucharist, the Church recalls both this absolute acceleration of God who has emptied himself of eternity to become man in time, and the absolute deceleration of the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ from time to eternity. The sacraments can thus be received to both cancel and yet to preserve this incarnational acceleration of the motion of time in digital computing and media. Against right and left accelerationists alike, this spiritual acceleration will be shown in myth and hope to supersede the violent apparatus of cybernetic acceleration. The origin of the post delusian movement known as accelerationism will be traced before Land and Fisher to the primordial beginnings of time itself, to the fall from eternity into temporality, and from the Garden of Eden onwards, to the poetic making of technics, logic, and cybernetics for the purpose of accelerating the motion of space through time. These cybernetic futures can then be cancelled by a true myth that still awaits to be fulfilled. Clocks not only count, but also frame our perception of the passage of time. Clock time has often been held in contrast to divine, natural, and liturgical time. However, if Christ is the center not only of natural creation, but also of the supernatural recreation that is recollected in the celebration of the liturgy, we can argue against both right and left accelerationism alike that the spirit of Christ in the church is the hidden soul of the world that animates the acceleration of all cybernetic systems, even the rhythm of every clock. What makes the pace of change accelerate? We can begin with a preliminary distinction of three elementary concepts, space, time, and motion. If space is the external manifold of a geometrical concept, and time is the passing away of each figurative determination of space, then motion is the singular becoming of space and time. To accelerate is, accordingly, to increase the speed in which space passes away in time, yet in so passing, is equally sublated in a singular motion of becoming, or of motion. What is the cause of this increase in the speed of motion? Since nothing comes from nothing, such an increase in energetic force must have a cause. 
the cause of acceleration must come from a new form of motion. Since space and time are the simplest concepts in the natural world, there can be no cause that comes in any sense before space or before time. Rather, the cause of acceleration must be discovered from among the history of technics, of mechanics, and ultimately of cybernetics. And since moreover these forms are not the product of force, the forms of acceleration must be invented, that is, constructed from simpler into more complex parts. We can observe the earliest movements of acceleration in the simplest of machines. For example, a ramp assembles matter into a form of an incline to shorten the distance of motion from a horizontal to a vertical surface. A lever redirects a redistributed downward into an upward motion across an axle to shorten the distance of force in motion. Lastly, a mill, whether of water or of electricity, gathers the dispersed forces of motion in a reciprocating circuit of simple and complex machines. In each case, the increased speed of change in motion or acceleration occurs when there is a diminution of the magnitude of space for any change in time, and the same change from one condition to the next is diminished as an interval of duration. This transition from finite to infinite mechanics or cybernetics carries with it the latent potential for the apocalyptic nova of an infinite acceleration of the speed of motion. With the invention of a general purpose digital computer, the cybernetic feedback loop of the central processing unit can script the program for the virtual production of any conceivable machine, its own machinic form, and the writing of the entire world in and for itself. For the Italian futurists, this increased speed of change was observed mechanically in the combustion of elements to drive mills, locomotives, and aeroplanes, for whom time is alienated from all relative and particular places of ancestry and tradition. The invention of the computer had coincided with the detonation of the atomic bomb. The ENIAC was first used to calculate the explosive blast of the Trinity test of the atomic bomb, and yet the nova of its virtual productivity would far exceed the blast radius of even the largest of bombs. Like the artificial owls in Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, the relationship between nature and artifice has now come to be decisively reversed. The archaic constitution of an ancestral genus of nature that stands prior to any momentary intrusion of technological artifice has come to be superseded by a general cybernetic system of financial exchange and computational administration that could virtually produce all of the elements of nature for its own purposes. Hence, as John Baudrillard described, Disneyland is not merely a fantastic representation of the real beyond the park. Rather, he writes, quote, Disneyland exists in order to hide that it is the real country, all of real America, that is Disneyland, end quote. This supersession of natural by cybernetic production calls for a new cybernetic politics. What essentially distinguishes the futurists from the accelerationists is precisely this recognition of the inescapable generality of cybernetic culture. For the accelerationists, this increased speed of change was observed cybernetically in the reciprocating programming of memory and action, the intellectualization of locomotion, and the absolutization of intellect, for whom this absolutized intellect is more than merely human. Rather, it is a cybernetic machine from which the plastic and analog procession of the brain and human intellect is imminently surpassed, even as its passing inputs can be assumed as the distributed program of its previous operation. What, however, accelerationism cannot account for is the more originary question of the invention of the forms of the acceleration of change in motion. Left and right accelerationism read techniques as sui generis, without questioning the originary and exemplified purpose of logic and techne. Once objectified, the auto-accelerating techniques assume a surrogate agency that makes humanity and humanist politics relatively obsolete. Absent of such a spiritual center of reflective consciousness, techniques and its acceleration is rendered objective in such a way so as to surpass all subjective agency and intuition. This subtraction of the formula of human consciousness and of the spirit of the world that has passed away may initially appear sublime, like a never-ending night of neon glow. As in Blade Runner, we search within ourselves for a saving mediate between God and the world, human and machine. Yet the absolutization of cybernetics would also suppress any trace of this absent middle, and leave for us no place for humanity to remember its higher destiny. This fissure of oscillating reflectivity can, however, be overcome by critically annulling the external production of the forms of technics and the change of motion in machines. For if, as the foregoing indicates, these forms of motion can only be first conceived to unfold into the external figure of mechanics, then such an increase in the speed of motion must be not only a movement of matter, but also an essentially a movement of the spirit. With this general survey of the sources of acceleration, I wish to propose a position which I suggest we call spiritual accelerationism. Spiritual accelerationism can be essentially distinguished from both right and left accelerationism by locating the originary cause of acceleration 
In the spirit of cybernetics, the essence of accelerationism is not technical but logical in kind. For in logic before technics, the division and combination of concepts is freely assembled to produce new forms. In contrast to Gilles Deleuze, it explodes the containment of the virtual under the imminent ground of the actual. And in contrast to cybernetic theory, it can, as I have shown in my newly published essay, Sacramental Engines, analyze computers into the elements of cyberneticism, infinite mechanism, and the dialectics proceeding in and from the divine logos. The pivotal acceleration from specific to general cyberneticism was initiated by Charles Babbage's design of the first general purpose computer, the analytical engine. Babbage's analytical engine is essentially distinguished from all previous and analog computers by its separation of the mnemonic store from the cybernetic mill, in which it reciprocally calculates its outputs as the inputs of new programmatic operations. It does not simply redirect a prior source of continuous mechanical force, but rather, and with unprecedented cybernetic autonomy, reflects from it to reciprocally calculate and freely determine the virtual production of its own intrinsic structure and mechanical forms. It could thus be advertised by Babbage as a machine of, quote, the most general nature, end quote, which fully anticipates the central processing unit architecture of modern digital computers. In his essay on the analytical engine, Babbage opens by quoting a line from Lord Byron, man wrongs, time avenges. He gestures here to the mythic fault of techne, to the retribution of the titan Kronos, and to the sublation of finite space into an infinitely accelerating singularity of time. For the invention of the analytical engine announces the infinite acceleration of the virtual production of machinic forms, the sublation of the universal of space into a singularity of time, and as Byron poem would also warn, the rupture of this temporalization of space from its pre-digital past. The invention of the digital computer thus initiates a radical temporalization of calculative reason. For if, as Catherine Pickstock has illustrated in After Writing, the lowest invention of a diagrammatic rhetoric had resulted in the spatialization of reason under a timeless ocular gaze, the Leibnizian invention of the computer has since collected the spatialized forms of all such diagrams to be freely calculated in an accelerating singularity of automated calculations. As in the Matrix film series, this radical temporalization of calculative reason would appear to assimilate human experience of time in a Lacanian reel of utterly inhuman computation. When absolutized, the cybernetic autonomy of computers would exceed all human comprehension and control. And as in the cyberpunk genre, this proliferation of digital computation and communication would thereafter elicit both techno-pessimism and an urgent apocalypticism. However, as my recent essay, Sacramental Engines, has begun to suggest, we can also recall a new light of hope in the digital age. For if, for Leibniz and Babbage, the form of a computer is independent of its material substrate, can be analyzed into the elements of cyberneticism, mechanism, and logic, and cycle among the forms through dialectical circuits in and from the divine logos, then we can argue that accelerationism is first animated by the spirit of God. For both right and left accelerationism alike, the computer is the concentrated engine of cybernetic acceleration. Yet in contrast to radically immanentist and materialist cybernetics, the form of computers can, as the foregoing has begun to show, be analyzed into the universal form of infinite mechanism or cyberneticism, in which the form of mechanism, as such, is infinitely divided into quantified forms, assembled into successive machinic combinations, and reciprocally calculated in any series of binary calculations. The form of logic is thus prior to its objective automation in computers. Once a form has come to be known beyond time, all of its forms can be freely simulated and virtually reproduced. This process of coming to know of concepts in and beyond time thereby ascends from diachronic temporal duration to synchronic apprehension of concepts amongst themselves. In coming to know the idea, reasoning passes through time, yet in knowing the ideas, reason apprehends the idea itself that can thereafter variously unfold across the horizon of time. Hence, although the forms come to be known in time, once known, they can be known beyond time. The acceleration of motion in time to and from the idea is thus an acceleration of pure concepts, of the spirit, or a spiritual acceleration. For, as in the motion of dialectical syllogisms, acceleration occurs in and among the concepts before it can be manifested under the imminent frame of the material world. This descending procession vertically unfolds in and through the spirits of the angelic hierarchy and horizontally in successive constitutions of nature, society, and technology. In Christian theology, this spiritual accelerationism is singularly concentrated and specifically consummated in the incarnation of God in Christ. Although the story of creation in Genesis and the Gospel of John does not explicitly distinguish between space, time, and motion, the canonic emptying of God from eternity to become flesh and time marks an infinite movement from the absolute to the singular. In recollecting God, we decelerate to recall the principle of creation, 
who is absolutely prior to time. Yet in recollecting God become man in Christ, we can also recall how God has emptied himself from this absolute priority to enter into and become present in time. The cross marks the pivotal event in the history of spiritual accelerationism, for on the cross the principle of creation itself is emptied, enters into, and dies as an everlasting witness of the eternal gift of creation that is continuously recapitulated across time and world history. Hence, in double contrast to both right and left accelerationism, the sources of acceleration are spiritual rather than material. Since nothing comes from nothing, the cause of acceleration of time must come from a prior form of logic, proceeding from and grounded in the divine logos. And against its latent tendency towards nihilistic misanthropy, we can recognize this face of divine and human freedom in the agency of machines. The dialectical opposition of right and left accelerationism can thus be critically sublated into a higher form of Christian and incarnational accelerationism, in which, as the center of creation, Christ is also the center of cybernetic acceleration. The recollection of Christ is thus both an absolute deceleration and an absolute acceleration of the experience of time. In absolutely decelerating and accelerating, it escapes from the order of time itself as it gestures beyond all time to a time that is hoped for and yet to come.